Physics, what is it good for? Physics forms the groundwork for how our world works, how things interact, and how they move. Without a proper physical model, our system will feel unnatural and janky. Having a proper physics system is just one of the many parts of making a good game. In this series, you'll look at how physics can be used for games and even go ahead and make a few yourself. You will not need a strong foundation in calculus or linear algebra for this series, since this is only covering the basics. However, they will become crucial for more intermediate and advanced topics down the road. I will be introduced to these topics briefly when they are needed, however, not in the most detail. That is left as an exercise. We will start by first defining some notion of position. This is necessary in order to really begin to understand how to describe motion. To do, to do this, we will need some origin where we can describe a position as some distance from that position. Uh, we can then describe our position as narrow, pointing from our origin to some other point some distance away. Notice that direction is a little important here. Our arrow could be the same distance away from the origin, but be pointing in different directions. Because of this, we will need two components to describe our position, a magnitude, the length of our arrow, and a direction, where it is pointing. This forms a special mathematical object called a vector. Vectors are crucially important to physics, so it is important we spend the time to get to know them. We write them with a little arrow on top. Now, it is important to note that vectors in mathematics have a more rigorous definition. I do not want to, I do want to explore this definition further in future videos, although for now this will suffice. One important property of vectors is that when we add two vectors, the result is another vector. Uh, vectors can also be scaled by things called scalars, and scalars can include things like real numbers. So we can describe a position as a single vector that is scaled by some amount that amount being the distance from our origin. This tiny single vector is called a unit vector and will have a magnitude of one. Unit vectors are written with a little circumflex, which we will call a hat. When working with multiple dimensions, we will now have to use two different vectors, one pointing up and one pointing to the right. We can combine both of these simply by adding them tip to tail like so. So we can describe our new vector as the sum of our two unit vectors, each scaled by some amount. This is also known as a linear combination, which will become important in a later video. I'm just name dropping here. The magnitude of our vector can be found using the Pythagorean theorem. The same holds for three dimensions. That is, scaling and vector arithmetic all work like we previously described, and we can use this three dimensional analog of the Pythagorean theorem to find the vector's magnitude. I leave it to you to prove that this is an accurate description of the length of a line for three dimensions. In fact, it is common notation to describe our unit vector as i hat, j hat, and w hat, each corresponding to what we would normally describe as x, y, and z. For simplicity, and a few other reasons which I will not mention, we can describe a vector like this, with each hat corresponding to its own row. Vectors can of course extend beyond three dimensions, although that isn't terribly useful for us yet. Regardless of its dimension, every vector can be broken down into its direction multiplied by its magnitude. Oh, Alright, so we got vectors down, and we can use them to describe the position of objects in space. Now it is time to use vectors to describe motion. Suppose we have the distance of an object at one position, and then we have it in another position sometime later. How can we describe its motion? Well, we have to find the vector that describes this change in motion. This vector has its tail starting at the initial position and its head at the final position. We can use our knowledge of vector arithmetic to describe the final position in terms of our initial and this magic vector. Thus, we can find that this vector is simply the final position, subtracted by the initial position. This is called the displacement vector, and I'm denoting it with this delta symbol because it means a change. Now, this doesn't exactly tell us the distance traveled. However, since we have the displacement vector, we can just take its magnitude to get the distance. Now, this is just one movement. What if our object continued to move? afterwards. In order to describe its motion, we're going to need to start considering the time between movements. Now, unlike before, we may have multiple displacements. To help us, notice that the displacement can also be decoupled into the displacement of our x and the displacement of our y separately. So let's zoom in for a second on one single direction. We will focus on the displacement over time for the x direction exclusively. We can see that, given a change in time, we have an associated displacement the slope of this graph is given by our displacement over time. This slope is what describes our object's velocity, particularly the velocity in the x-direction. 
By repeating this process for the y direction, we can now describe a vector that is the sum of the y and x velocity. This is our velocity vector, or the vector that describes how far our particle will move and its direction at any point in time. Now, what I have described here is very similar to how we would describe the derivative in calculus. However, because I don't want to talk about limits, and since this isn't a calculus lesson, this is as far as we will go, for now. The magnitude of our velocity is called the speed of our particle. You can imagine a velocity vector as acting on every point in space, so at every point our object will be displaced by a different amount. Following the exact same logic, we can also describe the acceleration of our particle as the change in our velocity. To visualize this, we can imagine another, another vector here, pointing in the direction of the displacement of our velocity vector. There is one final concept which I have not yet mentioned, and this is momentum. The momentum of our particle is its mass, multiplied by its velocity vector. Momentum is really important in physics because it is always conserved in a, in a closed system. That is, the total momentum at the end of an event, usually a collision, the same as the total momentum before the event took place. This is very useful for a variety of physics concepts, including our next topic. So, hopefully you learned a thing or two about how we can describe the position of a particle, and subsequently how we can talk about motion with velocity and acceleration. We also briefly mentioned momentum, and in the next video we will talk more about how we can use momentum to describe the forces on our system. This will become important when it comes to writing code um, to change our position over time using what is called Euler integrations, which will be the topic of our next video. Uh, if you like this video, make sure to like and subscribe and hit the bell button to be updated when I upload a new video. If you want to see me make a video on a specific topic or just enjoy today's video, then make sure to leave a comment as it helps me out a lot. Thank you for watching.